Every second of every day, four new people join the human race. Today, we number five and a half billion. We differ in color, costume, culture, and creed. Yet we are one species. Our origins have long intrigued scientists. When did a primitive ancestor become human? Important clues are coming to light. Bone by bone, bit by bit, an anthropologist reconstructs a shadowy figure from our past. He resurrects a distant relative with whom we have yet to come to terms. How do we define human? Is it anatomy or a distinct sense of self? With new technology, a biologist explores the past. Within us is an ancient tale written in genetic code. A tale of simple creatures who once embarked upon a journey from which there is no return. Creatures who crossed the threshold into human consciousness, who first ask the question, where did we come from? Who am I? It was the dawn of humankind. In southwest France, there is a region of limestone cliffs and deeply cut valleys. Its natural beauty and quaint villages are popular with tourists. But the Dordogne has another claim to fame. It is the site of some of the earliest discoveries of prehistoric people. Visitors are drawn here by a distinctly human fascination with the past. Some take home postcards of caves painted nearly 200 centuries ago. For others, it's a thrill just to walk in the footsteps of an illustrious ancestor. By a fluke of climate and geology, conditions in southwest France are ideal for preserving fossils the land is rich with traces of ancient lives. Archaeologists have scoured the area for decades, and yet there is always something new to find. This enormous cave is known as Le Placard. Recently, French prehistorian Jean Claude began work here because of a remarkable discovery. The placard was excavated repeatedly at the end of the last century. Cleared with pickaxe and shovel, it was then abandoned. Today's excavators use more exacting methods. In a patch of undisturbed deposits, Clot and his team find clues to the people who lived here some 19,000 years ago. Reindeer bones speak of Ice Age hunters. An exquisite spear point only hints at a stoneworking tradition honed over millennia. 
Such were the prehistoric treasures uncovered during the early digs at Le Placard. But one treasure was overlooked. It was an extraordinary bequest from a people long vanished. In 1987, a local archaeologist noticed something unusual. This wall was finely etched over most of its length. An expert in cave art, Clot was invited to examine the marks. They seemed random, but were man-made. A pattern began to emerge. A tail, hind legs, a swollen belly, the drawing of an animal. But which one? Est-ce que tu penses que c'est un bon idée ou est-ce que tu penses que c'est un cheval Oui, je pense que c'est un cheval et même un cheval à ventre gravide. Clot and his colleague believe it is a pregnant mare. At a glance, the images look jumbled, etched one on top of the other. To make sense of the patterns, each line is meticulously traced on a sheet of plastic. Granted, the drawings are subtle. Still, how could early archaeologists have missed them? Those engravings had never been found before, and that is one of the interesting uh, psychological facts about prehistory, and we might say even about the modern, the modern world. Uh, it's that uh, the people in the last century didn't see them because at that time prehistorical art had not been recognized as such. So in 1870s here, those people didn't know that some prehistorical wall art could exist, and so they didn't see it. They couldn't see it because the concept did not exist, and they didn't see it. They were blind to it. The tracings reveal the work of a skilled artist. A wild horse. reindeer antlers and a stallion's head. A young doe. And most mysterious of all, an abstract T-shaped sign. Ghostly images of a lost age. What do they mean? That function we are pretty sure uh, is, let's say, magical or religious, which is the same thing for those times. But beyond that, uh, there are theories, but uh, no hard facts. Uh, some people have argued that it was a means of communication to help the children get uh, the, uh, the knowledge of their fathers and things like that. It may be the case that it is religious in nature is certain because uh, people who've got the same sort of civilization, that is, say, hunters, gatherers, all over the world, which have been known for the past, let's say, 200 years, the people who do the rock art always do it for religious purpose or most times. So it is a religious art. But what sort of religion was practiced? What were the the rites that were enacted, the myths they corresponded to, and also what happened around it, see, the dances, the songs, etc., that we shall never know. Still, one thing is clear. Those who lived here crafted fine tools, created art, worshipped gods, features unique to modern humans, Homo sapiens sapiens. Where did they come from? Were they the first modern humans? In the last century, the answer seemed simple. In 1868, the French railroad system reached a town called Les Aisies. While laying tracks, workmen cleared out a rock shelter at a place called Cro-Magnon. To their surprise, they unearthed an amulet carved of mammoth tusk and the bones of an infant and several adults. Scientists recognized them as prehistoric humans and called them the Cro-Magnon. Anatomically, they resembled modern Europeans and were accepted as direct ancestors. 
found at sites throughout Europe, their tools of stone, antler, and bones were testament to their craftsmanship and advanced intellect. The Cro-Magnon appeared in Europe some 35,000 years ago. Although their image has been romanticized, their artistic achievements are undeniable. To a 19th century mind, the Cro-Magnon were proof that modern humans and the roots of modern culture had originated in Europe. But the idea was soon complicated by the discovery of another creature, one who had lived in the same valleys and caves as the Cro-Magnon. With flattened skull and massive brow ridges, huge teeth and protruding face, this was Neanderthal. These fossils would startle a world in which the concept of human evolution was brand new. Neanderthals left no cave art, no carvings, no hints of higher culture. Only simple stone tools. By the turn of the century, they were viewed as members of an ancient and primitive race, dim-witted, heavy-browed, and brutish. The characterization stuck. Neanderthals gave popular culture an enduring stereotype of the caveman. Could creatures this primitive be our ancestors? Or were they a branch on the family tree that went extinct? A century of research has helped separate fiction from fact. The human story has humble beginnings. 65 million years ago, the dinosaurs vanish. Mammals flourish. Soon primates appear, small tree-dwelling creatures. Some thrive in tropical forests. They become the African apes. Around five million years ago, a group ventures into the margin between forest and savanna. Although they have the face and the brain of an ape, these creatures take the first step toward humanness. They walk upright. Called Australopithecines, or southern apes, they are our earliest known ancestors. By three million years ago, they evolve into at least two distinct types. Some have powerful jaws and large teeth. They probably live on a diet of coarse plants and seeds with little meat. The fossil record suggests they go extinct. Their cousins have smaller teeth and a more varied diet, perhaps higher in meat. They may be more adaptable. By two million years ago, our ancestors stand only four or five feet high. But now they have brains double the size of any living ape. They make the first stone tools. For this achievement, they are called Homo habilis, which means handyman. Their descendants have brains nearly twice as large. Members of a new species, Homo erectus. They stand well over five feet, make better tools, and use fire. They are also the first to leave Africa. By 400,000 years ago, small populations are scattered across Africa, Asia, and Europe. They look enough like us to be called archaic humans, a primitive form of Homo sapiens. They acquire one feature 
no previous ancestor possessed. At Mount Sinai Hospital in New York, anatomist Jeffrey Laitman studies the upper respiratory tract of human infants. He found that the voice box, or larynx, is critical to the way newborns breathe and swallow. Like most apes and other mammals, human infants have a larynx positioned high in the throat, but the same region in a human adult is quite different. During the course of our development, something occurs that is unique among mammals, and indeed is one of the most fascinating things about human development. We're going to totally change the location in our throat of our larynx. This is un unheard of in other mammals. This is a massive change. Our larynx is literally going to go down in the throat. The high position of the larynx creates two separate pathways, one for air, and one for food and drink. Near the age of two, the larynx begins to drop. The change may aggravate ear infections and colds, but it heralds more articulate speech. By adulthood, the larynx is so low, the two pathways cross. Unlike other mammals, humans can easily choke to death when food goes down the wrong pipe. The larynx descending of the neck, however, has produced one feature of enormous positive value. That is a large resonating chamber, a large pharyngeal area of space, which opens up above the level of the larynx. And what this space can do, a space which is bounded by the back of the tongue and the pharyngeal muscles, this space can take the sounds that are produced inside the larynx and modify them to a greater extent than that possible for any other mammal or a baby human. Well, if we take a look at the upper respiratory... Without a larynx low in the throat, humans could not make the infinite variety of sounds that are the basis of spoken language. When did this unique anatomy arise? The larynx is soft tissue and does not fossilize, but an important indicator is the base of the skull. In most mammals, it is flat. In adult humans, it is bent. The connection led Leitman to study fossils. I've spent a lot of time examining the earliest of our ancestors, the Australopithecine. When one assesses the base of the skull of this individual, you find that it looks remarkably like a chimpanzee skull base. Most Australopithecines look like this as well. In other words, we don't believe our earliest ancestors could speak the way we can today. The question still remains, when did the pattern shown by modern humans come on the scene? Our data suggests that this is not until the arrival of members of our own species, Homo sapiens, who came on the scene some three to four hundred thousand years before the present. What sounds were uttered by the first archaic humans? We will never know. Their fossils are mute and few and far between. Only one group of archaic people is well represented in the fossil record. The Neanderthals, who appear throughout Europe and Eurasia some 150,000 years ago. In the hands of today's scientists, a new portrait of the Neanderthals is coming to light. For decades, most anatomical studies focused on their skulls. At the University of New Mexico, anthropologist Eric Trinkus bases his work on the entire skeleton. Bones are pliable, shaped by the stresses placed on them in life. Clues to the Neanderthal's behavior are etched in their anatomy. One of the differences we see between the Neanderthals and modern humans is that they are much more robustly built 
than modern humans. Uh, in fact, the average Neanderthal would probably make Arnold Schwarzenegger look like a wimp. Uh, what I have here is a thigh bone of a Neanderthal, and since th this one and others were found, we've known for a long time that the leg bones of the Neanderthals are very heavily built. They have large joint surfaces, uh, and they have relatively large shafts. And it's also been known that the shafts, if you look at them in cross-section, are quite circular, very round. And if we look at a modern human one, and this is one from the Middle East, uh, they are less heavily built, and they're kind of teardrop-shaped in, in cross-section with a crest on the back. To understand these differences, Trinkus digitizes cross-sections of thigh bones. Using the principles of biomechanics, he can estimate the kinds of stress involved in shaping the bone. In modern humans, the thigh bone is reinforced from front to back, a pattern caused by vigorous walking or running. In Neanderthals, the cross-section is almost perfectly circular. Activity of another kind shaped their thigh bone. They're very strongly built in an inside-outside direction, a side-to-side -side direction. And what that implies to us is that during everyday activities, the Neanderthals had a much higher level of side-to-side -side movement, uh, the kind of side-to-side -side movement you would get if you were running over a very irregular terrain or that you were chasing something that was moving, darting back and forth the way, say, a rabbit does when it runs away. Uh, we don't know exactly what the Neanderthals were doing that made their reinforcement uh, build up in this way on the shafts of their thigh bones, but it's a consistent pattern that the Neanderthals inherited from their ancestors, but it's one that changes with the appearance of modern humans. It's been known for a long time that Neanderthals have very large front teeth, uh, and what we know now is that by the time they reached the age of about 40, uh, they, most of them had worn their front teeth down to the roots. And what you see here is a fair amount of wear on the cheek teeth, but the front teeth are worn completely down to the roots and rounded off on the outside. Uh, microscopic studies of these teeth show that there are lots of chips on them and there are lots of scratches, scratches that go from inside to out, as though they're holding objects in their teeth and pulling on them, maybe shredding, maybe just using those teeth as a vice, that is as a third hand. Defects in tooth enamel show Neanderthal children were often malnourished. Most adults suffered at least one major injury. Some lived with excruciating pain. This heel shows bone spurs and a sign of severe arthritis. Where cartilage wore away, bone ground against bone. Only one in 10 adults lived past the age of 40. Yet as a people, they survived at least 100,000 years. No small measure of success. Neanderthals were the first humans to live in a glacial climate. They thrived during Europe's Ice Age. New studies of their technology reveal unexpected sophistication. to maximize raw materials. From a carefully prepared core of flint, they struck razor-sharp flakes. A single core would yield an entire toolkit. This technique requires more than manual dexterity. It shows a sense of economy and forethought. But Neanderthal's concerns went beyond mere survival. In 1960, archaeologists working in a large cave in Iraq unearthed several Neanderthal skeletons. Most had been killed when part of the cave collapsed. But one was different. A man in his 40s had been placed on his side in a shallow grave the soil around him would reveal large quantities of fossilized pollen. 60,000 years ago, a father or a brother was laid to rest on a bed of pine needles.
flowers were placed on his body. His passing was mourned. Neanderthals buried their dead. The discovery would narrow the murky gap between them and us. Perhaps they were the direct ancestors of modern humans. In 1932, British and American archaeologists were digging near Mount Carmel, 80 miles north of Jerusalem. They unearthed, in their own words, the world's oldest cemetery. Ten skeletons buried with stone tools, identical to those made by Neanderthals. The remains were shipped to England and the United States for study. Identifying the fossils was not easy. Some looked primitive. Others seemed modern. Researchers concluded that they were Neanderthals in the process of becoming modern. The idea was accepted for decades. But at the University of Bordeaux, one anthropologist saw things differently. Bernard van der Mirsch. Over 20 years ago, he began to rethink the evidence from the Middle East. Some of the fossils looked distinctly modern. Perhaps they weren't Neanderthals. To find out, he went to Israel in 1965 to re-excavate a cave called Kafse. He found what he came for. Two beautifully preserved skeletons, a child of five or six, and a young woman buried together. There was no doubt, anatomically, they were modern humans. Yet they left no art, no signs of modern culture, just simple Neanderthal-like tools. The discovery reinforced van der Meersch's growing suspicion that two types of humans had once inhabited the Middle East. In 1982, he and a colleague, Ofer Bar Yosef, began work in a nearby cave called Kibara. Here they discovered one of the most complete Neanderthal skeletons ever found. The question of chronology remained. In Europe, Neanderthals were older than modern humans. But in the Middle East, van der Meersch had his doubts. At Kafse, modern humans had been found in extremely ancient levels. Van der Meersch put forth an idea so radical, some colleagues questioned his reason. The discussions have commenced when the arguments began when, based on geological observations and fossil evidence, we proposed with my colleague Ofer Bar Yosef a very ancient date for the levels in Kafse. It meant we were saying that modern humans in the Middle East were alive at the same time as the Neanderthals, even the Neanderthals of Europe. It also meant we were saying that modern humans were much older than anyone had ever thought. Neanderthals and modern humans alive at the same time? The idea went against a view of prehistory held for nearly a century. Absolute dates were needed, but traditional dating methods fell short. Then in 1987, a new technology made it possible to date the stone tools from the Middle East. At the Center for Low-Level Radiation near Paris, Hélène Valada is a recognized expert in a technique known as thermoluminescence dating. The technique measures radioactive decay in flints that were burned in prehistoric fires. Valada grinds the flint into a fine powder. Only a minute sample is needed. Radioactive decay occurs naturally over time. 
To measure the amount of decay in the flint, Valada will heat the sample quickly. As the temperature reaches 500 degrees centigrade, the flint will give off a visible flash of light called thermoluminescence. The brighter the flash, the older the sample. In 1988, Valada published dates for the stone tools from Kafse. Her results were startling. Modern humans were living in the Middle East at least 90,000 years ago, far earlier than any previous estimates. Flints from Kabara showed that Neanderthals arrived in the Middle East much later, around 60,000 years ago. These dates push the emergence of modern humans back from 35,000 to 90,000 years ago. Neanderthals could no longer be considered the direct ancestors of modern humans. Discovery Daytime is brought to you in part by 10321. Just dial it and save up to 50%. Your room, Grammy, and uh, there's the phone. Feel free. But your phone bill. Oh, don't be silly. Just dial 10321 first. Why? It saves me money. Well, maybe a few quick calls. Good. 10321 saves on quick calls. I won't talk long. Don't talk all you want. It saves 50% off calls over 20 minutes. I won't call far. Well, call anywhere. International rates are great, too. Just dial 10321, then the number as usual. Anything else? A uh, privacy would be nice. So, Al, when are we going to see your new line of clubs? Uh, tomorrow. Yeah. My guy's on his way right now. So, Al, when are we going to see your new line of clubs? It's already up. There's business as usual, and there's e-business as usual. HP, expanding possibilities. I admit it. I don't like to take risks. That's why a Merrill Lynch Protected Growth Investment is right for my IRA. In effect, I'm investing in the stock market, but I get the earning potential of a rising market without risking all my principal, even if stocks decline dramatically. My Merrill Lynch financial consultant recommended protected growth for my retirement because he knows I like to play it safe. With my money, that is. The Discovery Channel, TLC, and Animal Planet, three of America's favorite cable channels, welcome the Travel Channel, the newest member of the Discovery family of quality networks. Through your local cable or satellite company, you can experience the wonder of the world. The new Travel Channel is committed to quality programming with world premiere specials, exciting new series. So whether you're the active traveler or experiencing the world from your living room, fasten your seatbelt. Go there, the new Travel Channel. Are you wasting money on spoiled food? Then you need Eurosealer, the amazing new sealer that creates an airtight seal that locks in freshness so food lasts longer. Simply slide Eurosealer along the edge of any bag and it's sealed airtight. It's that easy. Every time you open it, food tastes like it just came fresh from the store. Look, Eurosealer creates a seal so airtight even water won't leak. Amazing! Eurosealer keeps cereal crunchy, chips crisp, vegetables fresh, and deli meat delicious. One week later, Twist Tie Salad is brown and slimy, but Eurosealed Salad is green and fresh. Now on this exclusive TV offer, you can get Eurosealer for only $19.95. Call now and get Eurocan free. Eurocan leaves edges incredibly smooth. You can even reapply the lid. That's a $40 value, all for only $19.95. To order the Eurosealer and receive the Eurocan absolutely free, have your credit card ready and call 1-800-960-1414. Don't delay. Seal the deal and order today. Call now. The southern tip of Africa is a place of spectacular and primordial beauty. Archaeologist Hilary Deacon of the University of Stellenbosch near Cape Town has spent years exploring this landscape. Here, near the mouth of the Classies River, a series of wave-cut caves punctuate the rugged coast. 
Since 1984, Deacon has conducted excavations at the Classies Rivermouth Caves. His work adds new pieces to the puzzle of human origins. Traces of human occupation are unmistakable. The cave is filled with stone tools, animal bones, and food remains. I don't think we can take out this rubble here as SMB, and that'll expose the top of SM, the second shell mitten. And we can move with that. meticulous care, the team works their way through the deposits one layer at a time. Deacon has dated the earliest layers to over 120,000 years ago. Although the occasional mammal bone turns up here, the most frequent item in the prehistoric diet was shellfish. In places, discarded shells litter the cave floor six inches deep. A picture of the people who once lived here is slowly emerging. Their stone tools were similar to those of the Neanderthals. Traces of their ancient fires have been found everywhere. People lived in these caves for tens of thousands of years. Their primitive hearths were built one on top of the other. They tend to be circular hearths. They're about an inch in, in thickness, an ash in a hollow. And these have food remains on the edges of them, but uh, the main food refuse is dumped in particular areas away from the hearths. And this suggests that they organized their living space much as modern people would do. Who were these people? The fossils are fragmentary, but telling. This is perhaps one of the most impressive pieces of evidence that we're dealing with anatomically uh, modern people. In other words, people who, in their physical morphology, are just like ourselves. The tooth size uh, is well within the range of tooth sizes of modern people. And uh, the uh, chin here is quite prominent, which is also a characteristic of modernity. The people who lived here 120,000 years ago were modern humans, at least anatomically. But in behavior and culture, they may have been as primitive as the Neanderthals. It would seem a paradox. For years, scientists had assumed that modern humans must have modern culture. Discoveries in South Africa and the Middle East shattered that assumption. The origins of modern humans seemed more perplexing than ever. Then word came from an unexpected quarter. Bones and stones are no longer the only clues to human evolution. At the University of Hawaii, biologist Rebecca Kahn works with DNA. She reconstructs the human family tree by studying our genes. Most genetic studies focus on the chromosomes in the cell nucleus. Kahn studies the DNA in tiny structures called mitochondria. This DNA is transmitted solely from mother to daughter. Over the generations, it changes slightly or mutates at a fairly constant rate. In 1987, Can and two colleagues compared the mitochondrial DNA of 147 people from all major racial groups. So slight were the differences between them that all must have shared a very recent common ancestor. Can then built a family tree. Since Africans had accumulated the most mutations, it would seem their branch was the oldest. Knowing the rate of mutation, Can traced the mitochondrial genes of everyone alive today to one woman who lived in Africa around 200,000 years ago. 
I think in the origin of modern people, we will eventually find that this population that gave rise to us went through a phase very much like an endangered species. It doesn't mean that it was two people. It means it could have been anywhere up to 4,000 people. But that's a relatively small origin for a species in terms of a population size. If Cannes timescale is correct, it means that only one small group of Homo erectus in Africa became modern humans. All archaic humans, including the Neanderthals, went extinct. They did not interbreed with modern humans. They were totally replaced by them. The idea set off a heated debate. I was somewhat surprised uh, and taken aback by the level of controversy. Uh, but I think that it's good and it's a uh, it should serve as an example to any beginning student that you take an area where experts supposedly agree and you begin to probe and you find that there is no real agreement. Rebecca Kahn's work has polarized current thinking about modern human origins into two extreme and opposing theories. At London's Natural History Museum, scientists have been collecting and classifying life forms for over a century. The human animal is the subject of paleoanthropologist Christopher Stringer's research. He has spent over two decades analyzing hundreds of fossil bones and skulls. Stringer feels Cannes' genetic studies confirm what he sees in the fossils. He is the best known proponent of a theory called Out of Africa. The model begins around a million years ago. Small bands of Homo erectus leave Africa. They evolve into isolated populations of archaic humans. Neanderthals in Europe, Peking men in China. Then in Africa, some 200,000 years ago, modern humans evolve. Gradually, they move into the Middle East, Asia, and beyond, replacing archaic humans. They alone are the ancestors of people today. Under the Out of Africa model, modern humans begin in Africa. They move to Asia, and Asia becomes the secondary dispersal center. And on that basis, most of the racial differentiation we see today occurred in the last 50,000 years. At the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, another anthropologist disagrees. He has studied the same fossils as Stringer and yet reaches a different conclusion about the origins of modern humans. Milford Walpuff questions the accuracy of the genetic studies. He is an outspoken critic of the Out of Africa model. Walpuff proposes instead a multi-regional theory. According to this model, our most recent common ancestor is Homo erectus, who leaves Africa about a million years ago. Groups evolve into regional populations of archaic humans who continue to intermingle. Through gene flow, modern traits are carried from one people to another. Eventually, all archaic humans, including the Neanderthals, become modern. If Africans came and replaced people as the earliest modern humans, then the earliest modern humans should look more like these Africans. Well, I'd like to ask, where's the beef? Both models have their champions, but many scientists believe the truth lies somewhere in the middle. The question of our origins will not be decided by fossils alone, nor by genetics alone. The gap between ancient bones and living genes may soon be bridged. Scientists like Rebecca Kahn are now developing ways to combine the strength of fossil studies with the resolution of molecular genetics. 
Researchers in Cannes' lab are extracting DNA from human bones over 400 years old. Bones that are not yet completely fossilized. Experts are hopeful that DNA can be retrieved even from very ancient fossils. A family tree of unprecedented precision may soon be within our grasp, but a greater mystery remains. The past does not yield its secrets willingly. To coax it back to life requires hard work and infinite patience. Jean-Claude and his team seek clues to the last elusive milestone in human evolution. A profound change that occurred not in human body, but in human mind. For perhaps 100,000 years, anatomically modern people led a simple life. Cultural change was imperceptible from one millennium to the next. Then, culture took a quantum leap. It was heralded by the appearance of art. Over 30,000 years ago, people began to depict the world around them. They carved small portable objects from reindeer antler and mammoth tusk. With a profusion of body ornamentation, they proclaimed a new sense of self. They created their own symbolic universe of goddesses and gods. Their world was filled with sacred places, infused with myth. These underground caves were the cathedrals of prehistory. 13,000 years ago, three children walked here, perhaps entranced in the flickering light by images of dancing bison. What brought about this great leap? We may never know. The meaning of these images eludes us, but the message is clear. We had arrived. Today, we are driven to the dark caves with the same undaunted curiosity as our ancestors. Each generation embarks on the same quest. Each wonders anew, where did we come from? Where are we going? The next generation will find their own answers and see the past in a different light. Across the gulf of time, the visions of our ancestors still shine bright. Their legacy lives on in us as we continue the journey of discovery. The journey that began at the dawn of humankind. Coming up next, find out the traveler's fascination with the Alaskan frontier. It's more than what meets the eye on Wild Discovery. Tomorrow, step into the shoes of Siamese twins, joined at birth on Discovery Sunday on the Discovery Channel.